day. My name's Scott Whittaker, and um, I normally give a joke at this particular stage that I'm deaf in this left ear, uh, so if you want to heckle me, heckle me loud, otherwise it loses impact. So feel free to ask any questions as we go along. Um, I tend to ramble a bit and uh, talk about my passion, which is Australian history and invite questions, but the talk, we can go anywhere, we can go anywhere from publishing to genealogy to history to singleton specific to where we'd like to go. I'll we'll talk about trains for an hour, I'll talk about trains for an hour. Um, so there we go. The first question I always get asked is, why did you pick railway hotels? And I've been able to work out that it went back, probably when I was about five or six. My grandfather was a, um, a steam engine fireman and he used to sit me on his knee and tell me all these wonderful stories about trains. And of course he bought me a train set and, uh, and instantly I wanted to become a train driver, which I never acted upon, which is probably one of my life, life regrets, I suppose, but ended up becoming an air traffic controller. I uh, did that for 30 odd years until I lost my hearing in the left ear, which meant talking to aeroplanes was a bit awkward. Um, so I thought to myself, what am I gonna do? And uh, I wanted to travel. I've always enjoyed visiting little places um, around Australia. And, and I had done a lot of travel with my work. So I've been out and about and, and, and living in Longreach, you know, three and a half thousand people for a couple of years and things like that. A little bit hard for a Melbourne boy, but got through it, enjoyed it. And uh, so I thought I'll, I'll go around Australia on this bit of a trip and I'll have a beer in every railway hotel, thinking there's only 20 or 30 of them. So. You know, one too hard a mission. So I started researching and had 100, 200, 300, eventually over 700 hotels across Australia that had the word railway in their name somewhere. Not just specifically near the station, but it had to be called the railway hotel. There's one exception to that, a you know, little place in Chipperdale in Sydney was called the Rail Road Hotel. So I made a little exception to that. But there are a lot of other hotels like uh, railway type theme hotels like locomotive hotels, steam engine hotel, up at Werris Creek there was a single hotel, um, uh, there was uh, terminus hotels, all that sort of stuff that, that was associated with railways. So anyway, so I thought okay, well all I want to do is go and visit these places. And after visiting the first few, I soon discovered there was a bit of a story in this. And I started to wonder how many railway hotels there ever there was. And um, that's when I got my list, thereabouts. And I started then on a bit of a research project that I didn't expect it to go anywhere. I ended up with a folding cabinet full of stuff which I was going to donate to Australian National University and say, there you go. And, um, and we'll, you know, you can do what you like with it. But um, after a bit of cajoling with some friends, they said, why don't you put this down? They heard some of my stories. and. I said, it makes a good book, you know. So I've never written a book before. What am I going to do about writing books, you know? So I went off and put a manuscript together over a couple of years and for the first book, the Victorian book. And uh, living in Victoria at the time, it was easier logistically to do that than start with the Queensland book, which is probably my favourite one of the three, but anyway. Um, and I put it all together and, and showed it to a couple of publishers and they said, oh, no, it's a bit too esoteric for us. Um, so I said, oh, I'll bugger that, I'll, I'll publish it myself, which I did. So I formed my own little publishing company um, with the aim of, of doing it as a roughly not-for-profit type scenario. Uh, I quickly discovered that visiting historical societies and museums, a lot around the country are doing it pretty tough. Um, they go from really wonderful um, resourced facilities to um, one I encountered in Englewood in Victoria where the Historical Society cons consisted of old Bill, who was 92, I think, and everything was under his bed. And, uh, you know, if anything happened to Bill or his house burnt down or something, then the entire uh, history of that place is gone. So, so I figured I want to sort of try and, you know, once the book breaks even, try and put um, a bit of money back into helping people um, publish, specifically books on Australian history. And, um, and also help out historical societies as well. Uh, so that's the sort of the, the book. The interesting thing about it all is that my enjoyment of social history um, was brought out through this. So for whatever reason I went through school and they didn't teach us uh, Australian history. 
learned all about China, all those sort of things, but never really about Australia. Um, left to a few TV shows and reading a few books, but there's big, there's big holes in my knowledge of the general history of Australia. So as I started putting this together, I thought, gee, there's stories here, and it's trying to get drilled down into, you know, why did a publican you know, open up a railway hotel? And how was it that, that people, you know, how did they react when they got their railway finally? You know, there was the, all the stories, you know, prior to the railway coming, that a town would have a, a railway um, agitation committee, and they would work hard to get their railway, because it meant so much to them. And, and uh, Eventually the railway would come and there'd be a grand opening ceremony, we'd, you know, they'd do a whole bullock and all that sort of stuff and have champagne and oysters, which is you know, bizarre for what they did, and have a great ceremony and, and love their railway. And, and then uh, you know, within 30 or 40 years, the uh, advent of motor vehicles meant that the railway was becoming obsolete and uh, everything shifted to the road. So that's, that's sort of history of the railways I was interested to explore. So about a third of the book is, is um, all about the building and planning of the railways. Uh, and it's designed to, to show people who are not necessarily train enthusiasts how big and how important the railway network was. And I soon found that there was three, roughly, types of railway hotel. Where a town existed prior to the coming of the railway, um, often a publican, as they did in Singleton, would rename their house as the Railway Hotel in celebration or as a marketing tool. And the situation with that was a bit of a, a race, which public was going to get the, the rights to say railway first. And that often meant that that particular pub was quite a distance from the railway station. It's so the poor old traveller getting off the train you know, at three o'clock in the morning and tromping off to the, the Railway Hotel, which he thought was just across the road, end up being a mile or so away from the station and on the way you're walking past six or seven really quite suitable hotels. So they often didn't last very long as the railway hotel. They often renamed a more appropriate name shortly after that. The second batch were, were railway hotels that were built specifically for the railway, the arrival of the railway. So if, if uh, they're in the, the town area um, then there'd be a bit of a flurry of activity because people had seen what has happened in every other town across Australia, that when the railway comes, there's an influx of people and trade and all those sort of things. So there was a bit of a flurry, enough to be two or three hotels built, and sometimes it'd be a railway hotel, sometimes a railway view, sometimes a railway something other hotel, or just generic named hotels, commercials, royals, all those sort of things. Also, the, um, a lot of railway hotels were built for the railway construction camps. And in the very early days, now I'm not talking about the, the slide rod tents that followed the camps, these are properly licensed hotels. And all the way up through the Hunter Valley, all the way to Tamworth, right up through New England, up to the border, there was lots and lots of railway construction camps uh, that had attended railway hotels. Some are pretty basic single storey buildings, with um, corrugated iron roof and slab construction. Others were proper two-storey veranda hotels that they would often dismantle, take to the next camp, put up again, and they do that multiple times, um, until either the public was sick of it and sold it, or um, sometimes publicans would take a punt and think a town would grow from that railway camp. Because often the railways department would um, use the sites of the camps as the place to build their intermediate railway stations to achieve um, convenience for the farmers to be able to get their, their goods to the railway. In Victoria, for instance, the, the ideal was to have um, farmers no more than seven miles from a railway station so that they could bring in a load of wool or hay or not hay or wheat uh, in the morning or in the day and uh, then return in the afternoon. Um, so there was all these railway hotels amongst the camps. And the camps were an amazing place. I've come across some incredibly interesting stories. For the men, generally, the camp, um, they were a wild, lawless place. Paydays were fighting days, you get drunk. One of the camps out of Tamworth, um, 
for the first two or three months of its existence, there was no pub, not even a slow grub tent. And every fortnight, all the men would file down to the local post office and send the money back to their families. Uh, and then that very first week the pub was created, there was no money at all went back. It went from you know, hundreds of pounds being transferred back to zero overnight. So there was pretty hard drinking and fighting and gambling and all sorts of nastiness. But it wasn't all just men folk. A lot of families went there. And I uncovered a, a lovely story when I was researching. I had a lot of these hotels, all I had was a licensing record. So I found one up the other side of Gyra, a little place called um, Ben Lomond. And I had a licensing note that um, for about 18 months, the railway hotel on Ryander Creek construction camp was held by Mr. E. Hodder. And that's all I had. And I thought, well, that's going to be a pretty boring chapter. And I thought, well, I'd have to go up. So I went fossicking around Gyra and finally found a lady who uh, said I should go and see old Bill. And I said, okay, who's old Bill? And I said, postmaster. And okay, I'll go and see old Bill. And um, went down and met him. The Bush Telegraph had done its thing and he knew that I was coming and all that sort of stuff by the time I got down there. Shook his hand, said, g'day, I'm Scott Whitaker. He said, g'day, I'm Bill Hodder. I said, related to E. Hodder, the railway hotel? Yeah, he was my great, great grandfather. And um, he was able to tell me the story and fill me in on the family history research that his, he and his sister had done. And um, it turns out that Eli came to Australia in 1865, I think it was, tried his hand at gold mining and was no good at that and joined the railways as a railway construction person, also referred to as a navvy. Mm -hmm. And shortly after um, joining, he married. He was 29 at the time, she was about 14 or 15. Um, went on to have a whole bunch of kids, about 10. And for 20 years they lived under canvas, bringing up these kids. Eventually, at the end of 20 years, I'm, I'm assuming Mrs. Hodder said, enough's enough, he liked, we've had enough. Um, so they bought 100 acres of land about 50 miles further north of the railhead and they settled down to, to crop the land and run a few cows and live happily ever after. Eli um, saw the railway was approaching and fortuitously for him it ran right past his front door so he built his own railway hotel and uh, he ran it for 18 months or so until he died and then uh, his Mrs Hodder took over and converted it to a what was called a colonial wine license, which was a guest house type arrangement, but with that all the obligations of, of having a pub. And she ran it until she passed away, and then the building was used as a cook shed. Yeah. Old Bill said he used to play in it when he was a kid. Uh, it fell down eventually, and I said, "Well, Bill, can you show me where it is?" All excited because I didn't know where it was. I knew it was on Rwanda Creek somewhere, and uh, he took me to the was left of the family farm, which is now part of a bigger holding. And uh, he showed me, he said, at your prickles over there, that's where the railway hotel was. But I know that, he was able to take me to the site of, um, of the original brick kilns. All the culverts and all the bricks they used for building the railway were all nearby. And you could see the site where they actually mined the clay to actually move, uh, make the bricks and then moved on so that the kiln would move with the camp as it went along further into the north. So all those sort of things that I went from having one or two lines to a couple of pages, but what I think is really interesting, sort of family history, um, social history sort of stuff. And people sort of, you know, you're all aghast when I say that the wife was 14 or 15, but that was commonplace back then, you know. And, you know, concept of 12 kids or 10 kids, it's all, you know, as it was. But I uh, also wanted to, to sort of start exploring the social consequences of all these sort of things. And before I do that, I'll go into the, the third type of railway hotel. And that was the railway hotel that was built in later days of railway construction. When in the early days, I'm talking in the 18, late 1850s, early 1860s, the railways were often or mostly built by private uh, companies before they got taken over by the government, basically. And they had no, no problem at all in bulldozing through. Um, just the whole swag of houses didn't matter. I 
I've got a map in the Victorian book that um, they've just out of Melbourne, a place called Richmond, which is two or three k's out from the CBD. That they, when they built the, the line in 1858, it was um, about uh, 12 or 14 houses in the row. They got most of them. So, including one of the railway hotels that was only eight months old. So, uh, that is just bulldozers didn't matter. There was some compensation, but not, you know, not like it is. So, often the, towards the, the uh, 1880s, 90s, the cost of doing that became too great. And also, they were looking at reducing the cost of building railways. So, uh, things like if you had a major river or a mountain or something like that in the way, or if the, the city was, the town was in a, in a hollow, it would have made the railway really expensive to get down in there, they tended to build the railway remote. In some circumstances, the whole town picked up and moved to the station. Uh, other times, the, um, the, they would have a, a satellite town. The classic example, that's up at Warrielda, where you've got Warrielda town, and the railway was four or five kilometres away, and they, the satellite town was called Warrielda Rail. And there was a railway hotel built out there, and um, a couple of shops, I think, at the time, a couple of houses, and that was about it. Not much there now. The hotel still stands, it's not a hotel anymore. But there, that was the sort of situation, and often uh, if, if the railway was built in flat country, it was built around the edge of the town. So you end up with the station being quite a distance from the main street. And often a, a railway hotel, or several hotels will spring up near there. Um, often the very rough pubs in town, frequented by nasty types like railway men and shearers and all sorts of travellers and um, pubs that have been described as being not the ones you send your daughter to. So there were types of hotels and so you've got a whole bunch of, of hotels and, and th through the book there's a whole bunch of examples, really intriguing examples, why did people build hotels in places where there was no railway and in four locations across New South Wales that never ever ever had a railway, they built railway hotels. And the best example of that is a little place called Wollumla, which is down near um, Eden on the south coast. And Sir Henry Park stood up in Parliament and said, I'm going to build a railway down through here. And one enterprising public and believed him, and he built the hotel. And for 50 odd years it was called the Railway Junction Hotel because the branch was supposed to happen there. And eventually they gave up and changed the name to the Wollumla Hotel. And it's still there. And I was down there about 12 months ago cajoling the public into changing back to the Railway Junction Hotel for old time's sake, but he wouldn't be in it. So, so. And that, that happened a couple of times. Braidwood near Canberra was another example of that. And after 20 odd years of agitation, the government finally relented and said we're going to build a railway. And the town went absolutely nuts. So for a week of partying, celebration, people bathing in champagne, all sorts of weird stuff. And of course, the government reneged. And, and, uh, end up with a railway hotel and no railway and uh, didn't last very long. Publicans also took a punt on where the station would be and if the survey got changed or whatever they'd end up with a hotel quite a distance away which made it a bit awkward. Um, some changed the name of the hotel shortly thereafter, tried, a lot closed. But the whole idea of pubs back then, it's not what we think of them now. Uh, to get a publican's licence back, say in the 1880s, you had to be able to provide meals and accommodation for the travelling public, uh, for man and beast. So that, that involved having stables uh, and maybe a groom, blacksmith, something like that at, at the hotel to look after the horses, as long as a, with a big domestic staff as well, do the cooking and the housekeeping, run the bars. So, although some of the hotels were quite modest, um, some were quite big. You know, they ended up, you know, some being 100 rooms, which are huge, huge hotels back then. Um, and they had um, had to be pretty self-sufficient. Um, often, they'd have ch chooks and a pig, cow, that sort of stuff, um, veggie, veggie patch, fruit orchard, all that sort of stuff out the back. And the big land they had came handy for travelling entertainment like circus and animal menageries at, at Wagga in New South Wales down, down south. They had a, a travelling Wild West show that came in the 1880s and they had a real Indian, a real cowboy and a real Negro and it was quite the entertainment. 
they had a uh, travelling animal menagerie and uh, had lions and tigers and things like that. And talking, you know, the 1880s when people had never seen a moving picture of a of an animal, it was something in a book maybe, but not a not a real like we do now. Um, and the local paper said, yes, indeed, the lions are. Um, remarkable piece or something like that. So very, very magnificent piece and that sort of stuff. So it was quite taken everybody by storm. So the hotel tended to be one of the first commercial buildings built. So we ended up with um, businesses like banks, uh, services like churches running their business from the hotel prior to the erection of the Rome buildings. Um, as I said, the entertainment would come to town the hotel and paddocks, uh, visiting doctors, travelling salesmen, um, some of the doctors were real, some were charlatans, um, back in the days when you could um, not be totally truthful in your advertising, um, they used to say they could cure cancer and have magic tools that you solve all your problems. Um, was, there was one, uh, one faith healer that actually came through the whole area the son of a faith healer and he must have ripped off the people of the hunter you know, hundreds of pounds because he, he was amazing what he could do and people used to keep going back and it's remarkable that people still uh, get sucked into that sort of stuff as well. Uh, that's good, uh, it's all part of life. And uh, the travelling showmen, they'd be fantastic to come and do their shows and, and uh, there was one particular one up at uh, Mwoolam Bar in, in uh, northern New South Wales where a travelling snake charmer wanted to come and do a show at the railway hotel. And uh, he um, arrived to find another showman doing a show at the front of the hotel. So he thought, oh, I can't, uh, can't cut his lunch. I will go into the pub a couple of quiet beers and I'll come out if you finish. And uh, of course he puts down his case or he points in the port and goes in for a couple of beers, comes out and sees a kid running down the street with his case, takes chase, bails up the kid in the... Uh, the outhouse of the backyard somewhere and just as he's about to open the door with the kid out um, here's a blood curdling squee scream that uh, all the snakes have got out been opened up and the kid goes running back at a mere miles an hour and all of a sudden you know he picks up all these snakes and goes off and does his, his show but I've got a few stories about snakes in the book because there's nothing like a good snake story um, you know like probably now if people are honest the only good snake's a dead snake that's what people think and the stories of uh, snakes coming into pubs. Uh, my favourite snake story is, or two, that the, out of Bell Ranald, um, a shearing team had come into town after they'd finished up and had plenty of money to spend, and they got pretty drunk, and the old pub they just had a nerve and fall, and then slithered a big old brown snake, and the uh, shearer reached down and picked up the snake, about a foot down from his head, and says, look fellas, one of my pets has come to see us. And of course, the snake just promptly bit him on the wrist. And in those days, the treatment was you had to well, first suck all the poison out, then you got something sharp and tuck away as much of the flesh as you could, and then you could inject ammonia into it. I don't know why they did that, but that's what they did. And then when the patient started to get a bit drowsy um, from the effects of the poison, you would administer copious amounts of brandy. And they did that to kids as well, so I reckon they killed the kids with brandy probably more than a snake bite. Anyway, so they put this old fellow to bed, he wakes up the next morning, bright as a button, say fellas, what did I bump into last night, you know, no recollection at all. So, you know, treating with ammonia, like there was a bloke who got bitten on the tongue by a snake now, I don't know how that happens, but he did. And uh, injecting ammonia into his tongue after he slashed it all up, cut half his wood off, but they did that sort of stuff, so. And I wanted to explore the, the lighter side of life and uh, the larrikinism, you know, and uh, I wanted the, the story of, of pub life to sort of be explored so that it wasn't all gloom and doom because just as it is now, there was every, every type of crime you can think of happened back then. Politicians are probably more corrupt back then than what they are now, although that's pretty arguable. Um, they're very fond of, of debating the route of a railway. And, and then go out and grant each other land. And back then to actually take ownership of the land, all we had to do was improve it by putting a fence around it, a couple of cows on it, which they did, and then sell it back to the government. <coughs> and I thought, how could you get away with that? Until I found out in Victoria recently a, a politician did it 
the same. He actually had bought land just before that, and now so building a freeway through it. And he made a bit of money out of that as well. So it's amazing that if you live long enough, history is this big circle. But, uh, you've seen it all before. And we keep thinking that we need to uh, invent things brand new, but we probably don't. We've probably got enough history to work out stuff now, but it's all a bit constrained. So. So I did all that and, and crimes, you know, were there. Um, I wanted to explore concepts like the good old days, what were the good old days. And really, unless you had money, influence and power, preferably all three, um, life was pretty hard for most people. Uh, you know, I used to think that, oh, you know, people travelled, everyone travelled by train, but train travel was expensive. Um, the, when the first railway was built between Melbourne and Bendigo in Victoria, um, to go about 100 kilometres costs the equivalent in today's money about $75. So everyone, like today, if it costs you 75 bucks to go to Maitland on the train, you would say that's probably a bit expensive, I might drive. Um, and today's train fare is about 4 or $5 to go the same distance. So um, that's a fair bit of money back then. Um, likewise, you know, only really the, the well-to-do could afford a horse to ride. Most people walked, pushed wheelbarrows, and uh, it takes a long time. That's why you need a network of pubs. Because you stay out each night after a good day's walk, and all that sort of stuff. But the other side too, that I was getting to before about the, the, the pubs being different to what they are now. Um, the publicans would often build a hall next to their hotel, especially in the smaller communities. And that was that would predate for a long time, but, concept for shire halls and things like that. You know, local councils would run their business before they had enough money to actually build their own, own hall. And dancing was uh, a very favourite pastime. Interestingly, the uh, publican had to apply for permission to stage a dance or have music out on his premises. And I used to, my son's 22, and he'd go out dancing in my gloves in Melbourne all night, and I used to go, no, no, no. That's not a very good thing to do. You're young, you know, blah, 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 blah. So I started this project and realised that dancing, you used to go till dawn, these, these functions anyway, so nothing's really changed. Um, it's probably only the, like, just through the book, there are lots of examples of you know, crimes of passion and things like that. Uh, yeah, funny days that our, our approach to, to people and relationships back then. Uh, for many years in New South Wales, if a couple are presented at a hotel and to have a one room, they had to present their marriage certificate um, and uh, all sorts of stuff like that. So there's a bit of forgery in marriage certificates went down and all that sort of stuff in the old days. And likewise, I was looking at all the, the licensees of hotels, the publicans themselves, and um, it appeared to me that, especially in the 1880s, 90s, anybody who get a public license provided you were mate and not in jail. And uh, on several occasions I've come across examples where uh, single women have tried to apply for a license and been told to go away. Even though the bar was being run perfectly by barmaids, there was no, you know, a woman was, woman was uh, considered not um, capable of running the business of the hotel and the situation was the only way a, a woman could get the license was if she was became widowed and the license would pass to her but only if she didn't have a son who was over the age of 21 because the big expectation was the son would take the license which I found really bizarre because through the book I've got all these examples of, of women running pubs for 40 sometimes 50 years and doing a fine job, being quite uh, remarkable members of the community. Down at Tamora, um, the lady who ran the railway hotel down there, Bridget Corbett, for 40 odd years. She, um, she was passionate about rugby league, she sponsored the local competition, they still play for the Corbett Cup to this day. And that was around 100 years ago. Um, and, and likewise, you know, the publicans of the day who ran respectable hotels, Right up there with station masters and school principals and all that sort of stuff. So it was quite a quite a reasonable uh, profession. But 
like everything else, there were some crooks. People who used to run pretty ordinary hotels as well. And that's the same with business, wherever. Um, it wasn't until about the 1930s, and this is in the Victorian book, that um, the first real challenge to being a single woman taking a licence was taken. And that was where the publican down at a place called Bannockburn had, uh, he was pretty old and pretty uh, poorly, and he wanted to transfer the licence to his daughter, who had worked in a pub since she was about four. Uh, and she was about 22 or three, something like that. And the licensing people said, no, no, go away, silly deal, you can't, you can't do that. Um, she took it to the Supreme Court and his honour said the same thing, run away. And it wasn't really until the 50s, 60s, 70s that actually attitudes had changed enough. You know? And I, I was, you know, got hard to get my head around that sort of attitude now, but when, when I was really putting the book together, I uncovered a, an ad uh, in, during the First World War. And it basically said uh, that now that all the men folk have gone off to fight in the war, you women folk actually have to stand up and take the load. Now, if you take these pills, they'll make you stronger heart, stronger mind, and stronger limb. And they will help you deal with the handicap of being a woman. That was all very well to say, okay, you know, we're going to rely on you during the war when there's no blokes around. But outside those times, you know, and I just couldn't believe it, you know, and that sort of thing. And even the, the treatment of Indigenous people early days, you know, there's, a, there's a few bits and pieces I learned about the hum, hum, Human Hobble expedition, um, about characters of, you know, I just expected it to all be the same sort of, you know, people, but Hume was quite conciliatory, he actually spoke, um, he was able to speak with Indigenous people. He didn't want to fight them, whereas Hobble was the opposite, he's a bit older, all he wanted to do was shoot people. Um, and there was a, you know, at Cryo Bay in Victoria when they finally got down there, there was an incident where um, Hume was off skirting around the bay, and got back to see Hobble surrounded by a whole bunch of pretty angry Indigenous men, with spears drawn, and, and he's with a pistol, sort of. And it could, it could have been the massacre of Cryo Bay that we'd be talking about these days, but from those attitudes of, um, you know, well-meaning people, um, you know, down in Gippsland in Victoria where uh, it rains for nine months of the year. There would be contact between the European women and Indigenous women and the European women would ask the ladies to take off their possum skins. Forget that they've been wearing it for 40,000 years, but take them off and use this blanket instead. Uh, rain overnight and mum and the kid would die of pneumonia because the blanket gets wet and cold. But the possum skins are perfectly dry and keep you beautifully warm. The perfect, perfect thing. So this ignorance and bias and all that sort of stuff. But the government had a bit of a problem because they had so many pubs, and several little towns of, that I know of that had about 500 people they ended up with 15 to 20 pubs in that town, which is a lot of pubs. Uh, so the government issued a couple of schemes. Uh, one was a, a, a buyback of licences, a bit like the buyback of guns a few years ago where they paid compensation and went through a process of what was called local options polls so the people of the electorate were able to vote on the number of pubs they wanted basically. And during that period too if you wanted to open up a brand new pub uh, you actually had to go to a local options poll and get the support of the community as well as the licensing authorities to open up a pub. And in some, some um, remarkable uh, areas, um, the community voted for no pups and they went to totally dry prohibitionists in Box Hill in Victoria, uh, Shire Boorundara was, was one of those areas where all the pubs were closed down basically overnight and uh, compensation was paid but there was no pubs and that still exists in that municipality now. Um, so it's, it's interesting how it ebbs and flows. Um, pubs became a little bit less lucrative when things like motor vehicles came on the play. Um, and they're still, right into the 30s and 40s, are still not a bad investment. So much so that the big breweries in Sydney, you know, Tooth and & Co, and big property developers like the forerunner to LJ Hooker, um, the De Gurr family, um, was really active around this part of New South Wales, uh, buying up pubs, bulldozing them, and putting up fancy new ones. 
often in the Art Deco style, and making a bit of money out of them until things like the Second World War came along and things like that. And the social consequences too, in the, in the very first uh, licence that was issued in 1794 to a part of the Parramatta. From that point on, we had a very high, highly regulated government control of the industry um, that regulated when you could open and close and who you could serve and that sort of stuff, no alcohol to Indigenous people, for instance. But the one curious thing is that it was up to the public to decide uh, if a child was suitable to take drink. So the stories of kids 10 and 11 coming into a pub and being, being supplied alcohol. And that was the time, that was how it was back then. And it wasn't until the early 1900s we actually had proper age-based rules. Um, the, um, yeah, I want to explore things like six o'clock closing. And I've read a lot of stuff about you know, the prohibition movement, the temperance movement, that worked really, really hard behind the scenes. Um, the last straw for the government of New South Wales was um, during the First World War, a uh, whole bunch of uh, army recruits at Liverpool uh, didn't like their camp very much, went on a rampage, marched into Liverpool, drank the town dry by about 10 o'clock in the morning, commandeered a couple of trains, drove them to Central Station, held up to Central Station, a bit of a gunfight, that sort of stuff. One bloke was killed, um, later referred to as one of the most infamous uh, chapters in Australia's military history, um, and that was the end of, of the free trading of alcohol. Um, the government knee-jerk reaction um, saw that and said, oh, we're going to close the pubs at six o'clock. Um, nobody foresaw or, or had the time to think about the social implication of that and the spike in domestic violence, alcohol-related domestic violence, which was always unreported back then, unless the, the poor woman or children were killed. Um, and then there was probably hush-up anyway. Uh, but that was a, a, a very unintended consequence. And here we are 150 years later, and old Mr. Bear's running around backwards you know, after he's trying to ban greyhound racing and things like that on a knee-jerk reaction. So it's another one of those you know, big circles of history. So all those sort of things come into play. Um, the fun and games, the, the way people conduct themselves, all that sort of stuff. And, and the public houses were okay, mostly, but some pretty bad ones around the traps. And the more isolated areas tended to be pretty ordinary, but to do with the public, I suppose. But I'd like to finish on my favourite story, and that's the, um, the poor traveller running up to the railway station. He's on one of these branch lines with a train ran every week or so, and he just sees his train disappear in the distance. And he yells out to the porter, hey, when's the next train? He said, oh, Tuesday. He said, but it was Wednesday today. He said, yeah, Tuesday. He said, what can I do? Where can I stay? And he says, well, there's two pubs in town. There's the railway and the royal. He says, come on, man, which one's the better one? Which would you stay at? And the uh, porter says, well, it doesn't really matter. You know, they're both the same. No, come on, man, which one's the better one? He said, well... It doesn't matter because at three o'clock in the morning you'll be lying in bed awake wishing you'd stayed at the other. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's how they were back then. It's, sort of, um, you know, it's a really interesting. I, I found the whole, whole process is so enjoyable. And, um, and meeting people, travelling the country, and, and seeing that the work that a lot of historical societies do and the generosity uh, of people's time to actually maintain their passion for history, like my passion for history. It's really important and in this era when there's government cutbacks you know, things like the National Library of Australia, which is it's vital that we maintain that level. You know, Trove is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful tool. And I'm um, sure many books in the future will be written directly from you know, research from Trove. Um, interestingly, um, when I was doing my research, um, what I like to try and do was actually try and build a bit of a picture first and then refer to previously published works to see how, how close I've got to what's been written before. Um, and there's one example again in Victoria uh, where one particular hotel was relocated to another place and when they finished moving it, they actually added to it. Uh, the local paper wrote it up as being a brand new hotel from scratch. 
and that was what was written in the in the local history of the hotels of Geelong in Victoria by a very eminent historian, um, based on a newspaper article, the pre-trade days, but you know, going through the paper, like film, all that sort of stuff. What you didn't get was a retraction from him three days later. It said, sorry, um, it wasn't, we made a mistake. So you can't stop at one. You know, if, you, if you're going to research, you've got to force yourself to you know, push that next couple of days beyond because it's so tempting. And in this era of cut and paste, people just, with the internet, um, people treat what's on the net as gospel. Uh, I've got numerous examples of, of photos from everybody from the National Library down. Um, they're miscaptioned, wrong town, wrong pub, um, and that's the tip of the iceberg. Um, and because written on the back of the original card might be the incorrect information, that's how it's presented. So yeah, there's not much you can do about it. You can just put contrary evidence out there saying that you know, here's a building plan and then that's that one it has to be that. So um, so it's a bit of a you know, trap for for new researchers, especially internet-based researchers. Um, but it's certainly opening up a lot of um, interesting concepts as, as being able to compare things, which is good. So there you go. That's my afternoon talk. I've run out of voices. <laughs> now I need a beer. Talking about pubs all that time, I need a beer. Sure. <laughs>